I'm super excited being here. So I said, my name is uh, Tzachi, or Zach, if Tzachi is hard for some of you, so uh, Weisfeld. And, um, and I am a serial entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. Uh, about 27 years of, of doing all kind of crazy ideas. But I've also been a corporate entrepreneur. I just left Microsoft for the third time. So, yes, I, I was there three times, and I just left again uh, three weeks ago. Uh, because I like to start new things, and I like to leave a mark in the places I go to, and I, this time it actually was fairly long, eight years there. And I'm going to share with you some of the uh, magic I think we did inside Microsoft for trying to reinvent the company, especially when it comes to working with startups, and working with startups all over the world. So, not corporates are dead. I don't think that corporates are dead. I think that corporate innovation is dead. Corporate innovation in the way we know it, in the way that many of us have been doing it for many, many years, is gone. But it's gone from the way that we know it. And there are new ways to ignite innovation in corporates. And I think a lot of people I talked to here in the past day or two have exactly the kind of things that can help corporates change in a significant way. So when I say corporate innovation is dead, I mean it needs to be reignited. And, and it can be reignited by two things. Startups and skunk work. How many of you are familiar with, uh, with, with what is skunk work, the term? OK, not that many. So, um, so a little story about skunk work. So skunk work was the name of the Lockheed Martin project that they started in the 40s to build crazy projects, super fast. Uh, they built a jet, a combat jet plane in 173 days from start to end. And the idea behind Skunk Works, the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, was we're going to take a team of super, super talented people and we're just going to let them go. No permissions, no corporate DNA, no long procedures to get the budget approval. We believe in the team, we believe in what they can do, and we're just going to let them go. And they produced some amazing projects since then. So we have a few more organizations around the world that have this kind of a skunk work approach. So many of you are familiar probably with Google X, right? Some really great projects coming out of Google X. The Nike Kitchen, where Nike is producing some really interesting uh, uh, projects. And I love the sign they have on the door. We hear you knocking, but we're not going to open up the door. We hear you knocking. We know you're out there. We're not going to show you what we're working on here, because we're doing some really super cool stuff. And if you're going to intervene, you're probably going to get their energy off. And then Amazon Labs 126, that also produces some really cool uh, stuff that many of you are using. So these are some of the uh, skunk work projects or teams that corporates are putting together. There is a, there's a big debate in the industry if this actually works still. Uh, I think Steve Blank thinks it doesn't work anymore, and there are others that think that, that, um, that skunk work projects, you know, we need to rethink that. But also another, another thing is internal passion of people inside these organizations to change and use their knowledge to do a change. How many here know who this guy is? No one. How many here know what this is? Right, probably most of you are using Gmail. So Paul did a college project of an email service that he developed in college. Later on, moved to work for Google. And they needed part of their messaging strategy, an email service. So he worked on it because he had the passion to do it. It was not a big Google project to start with. And here you have an employee with the right skill set, with the right DNA, the right energy, building something that became something that probably most of you are using today. Right? And that's, the, that's Gmail. The Israeli skunk work is different. I have a lot of meetings with CEOs 
that are coming to Israel and want to build an R&D center in Israel. We have about 310 global R&D centers in Israel. And when I tell them most times, if you want to come and develop software in Israel, sometimes it's too expensive, it's very hard to hire now in Israel, the only way it's going to work is if you're willing to give your team enough degrees of freedom to go crazy, to do stuff they strongly believe in and trust them. Trust, super critical. Trust them, they know what they're doing. Trust them, let them go, let them do something big. And it's not easy because we don't listen that well. And executive management in Microsoft, in Google and other companies tell us what they want us. We don't always listen exactly to what they say because we have this internal truth that we believe that we know what we need to do. We're gonna deliver on the KPIs and things they're asked to, but we can do something bigger. We can do something more significant than what we're asked to do. So that's part of the Israeli way. Not easy to deal with if you're a big corporation, but that's part of the Israeli way. The story that we often tell is the story of Intel in Israel, where early, in the early 90s, the team in Israel in Haifa decided they want to develop a low-power chipset. And the team in Oregon, in Intel and headquarters, said, no, we don't think we should go for low-power processors because the world is going to data centers and this is what you should be focused on. And the team in Haifa was very, very, very passionate about developing these low-power processors. So the, what I was told is the last meeting, executive meeting in Oregon, where the team in Israel came and said, this is what we want to do, and the decision at the end of the meeting was, look, guys, if you want to do this as your last project in Israel, and we're going to shut down the Israel R&D center because this is going to fail, go ahead, do that. And they decided to do that. And Ottolini, the former CEO of, of Intel, was quoted uh, once saying that Intel Israel saved our butt because at a certain point, 80% of Intel revenue came of IP coming out of that uh, R&D center in Israel. So all of you know your laptop uh, uh, chipsets. So most of the laptop chipsets, you know, the Centrinos and, and the ones that came afterwards, came out of that idea of a team in Israel that didn't listen because people at headquarters wanted something else and they thought there is something that they know that others don't see and they should bring that, they should do that. Again, you need to be very clever organization to be able to work with that kind of energy, not easy. So that's about trying to get corporate innovation from a different place, from this super internal energy of the skunk workers. And many people say that Israel should change its name from na startup nation to skunk work nation, because we have so many of us with this, this energy of changing, changing from within. But look at the list of, of uh, products in the back. What's the, common, what's the commonality of these? Anyone? They're all from Google, right? But startups, they were all startups. All of these companies were startups. Yes, Google acquired them. And they drive significant growth of Google. So the corporate innovation of Google, if you look at it, and look at the things that are driven out there. We looked at Gmail that comes from within from someone that knows something and wants to go and, and chase that and startups, amazing things like, like uh, YouTube and Waze and Android. But working with startups for corporates is super hard. It's even harder than working with Israelis. In most cases, corporates kill startups because they don't know how to interact. <clears throat> so this animal is not an easy animal to work with. And, and again, many corporations don't understand how hard it is to work with these animals. They think differently, they work differently, they're a different pace. And they, many of you, make many times mistakes by trying to work with corporates in the wrong way. Part of my role in Microsoft, a big part of my role in Microsoft, was to protect startups from Microsoft, to make sure you don't do the wrong things because it's going to cost you your lives as a startup. Wouldn't cost Microsoft life. So, um, 
tell you the story of how what it in Microsoft started. So I rejoined Microsoft, uh, let me go back for a second. So I rejoined Microsoft about eight years ago. And I was hired to do two things. I was hired back into, I moved back from Silicon Valley to Israel, and I was hired by the Microsoft Israel R&D Center to get acquisitions going, because we believe that we will grow in a non-organic way. Just for you to know, in the past, year, uh, past couple of years, Microsoft Israel R&D grew 25%, where Microsoft generally shrunk. And it's grew through seven acquisitions. Fairly significant. So I was hired to connect Microsoft to startups and to create acquisitions. But very quickly, I figured out our problem is not Israel. Our problem is not connecting in Israel. Our problem is we don't know how to speak to startups. And I was walking around with a blog post. So this guy is Paul Graham. Paul Graham is the founder of Y Combinator, the world's best startup accelerator. And in 2007, this, by the way, still exists on his personal blog, this uh, post. He posted a post that said Microsoft is dead. By the way, it's not. Still doing actually pretty well. So uh, he posted a blog that said Microsoft is dead. He said three things. Microsoft is dead. Microsoft used to shed a big shadow on the technology world. I haven't realized when the shadow disappeared. And the third thing he said is I don't invite Microsoft anymore to my demo days. And if you're not invited to a Y Combinator demo day, you're out. You're not part of the game. You're not part of the picture. So it was black over internet, but we never read this. We never realized that we're out of the game. So in November 2011, I went up to meet with Satya. Satya was the head of our uh, cloud and servers division. And I said, Satya, I want to reinvent the way Microsoft deals with entrepreneurs. I want to do it differently. A different way, a different approach of connecting with startups. And there's a big debate how this meeting really went and what was approved, was not approved. But reality is that most of the people at Microsoft said, no, we shouldn't do that. I wanted to start by doing a small startup accelerator out of Tel Aviv as a pilot. And people said, it's a mistake. You shouldn't do it. People inside Microsoft thought it's a mistake. I'm going to give Microsoft a bad name because we don't know how to do it. We should probably hire tech stars or someone like that. People in the industry thought it's a mistake. So the first thing I did, I called up uh, David Cohen, the founder of Techstars. I said, hey, it's about time to come to Israel. Let's open up an accelerator. And David said, ah, not now. It's not the right time. It's not the right funding model, etc." I went to people in the industry. Yossi always said yes. Yossi always says yes for crazy, as the craziest idea you can. Yossi would say, go ahead, do it. But there are other people. So Yaniv, a good friend of mine, a VC in Israel. And Yaniv told me two things. He said, not a single entrepreneur in his right mind would want to join a Microsoft Accelerator. And the second thing he said, if they're going to join a Microsoft Accelerator, I'm not going to invest in them because they made a mistake. They just show me they're not smart entrepreneurs. And he's a friend. <laughs> Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, Yaniv, at our second demo day, wrote a, uh, a blog post that says that he's looking for a hat to eat because he was an idiot, so that was nice of him. Um, and then there were people that were super supportive of that. You know, Yossi is one. Yossi was there when we opened the first uh, accelerator. Uh, my boss at Microsoft, Yoram Yakobi, a super amazing guy, the most optimist and, and passionate person that I know. And, and what Yoram, as my manager at Microsoft, said, he said, look, I don't understand what you're talking about. You've been blabbering about this startup accelerators for, for a long time, but you have a very unique passion in you. You have a light. I don't want to turn that light off. I'm going to support you, and I'm going to believe in you. Go and do this. Even though we're a big corporate, go and do this. And this is how we started. So we started the first, first accelerator in April 2012, out of uh, um, the Microsoft R&D site in Israel. It was not an easy start. Now we have eight. So the Microsoft, now called Scale-Up Program, uh, we opened up, so two months after we did Tel Aviv, we opened up Bangalore and Beijing. Now we have Shanghai, uh, Berlin, London, uh, Seattle, Tel Aviv, and we just opened up Sydney. I know the question about Guatemala, but I'm no longer there, so they should do it. I'm not there. <laughs> um, 
But did it work? Because you can open up locations and it may not have worked well. So the program was awarded for five years in a row as the best program in China. Out of 5,000, well, 5,000 is a two-month-old number, probably 5,500 accelerators in China, uh, the number one program. Um, Fortune named us the number one ecosystem builder in India, and by far the number one accelerator in Tel Aviv. So it worked out pretty well. 760 companies went through the program. They raised $3.6 billion, 54 exits, five IPOs. So it's only second to Y Combinator when it comes to the results of that program. And again, remember, this, thank you. And this is where no one believed we can do it, no one believed that Microsoft can do it. I'll tell you the secret at the end. What, what were the secrets that, that made it happen? Um, so, as of the last month, I'm no longer doing this, but my last position in Microsoft, I ran all of Microsoft startup programs. A program that's called BizPark that I, probably some of you are familiar with. About 100,000 startups around the world that are using uh, Microsoft technology and services and support. Uh, accelerator partner program, about 200 partners from 47 countries. Uh, about 5,000 5, startups through that. Um, I told you about the Microsoft Accelerator. Our startup growth programs, which are all about connecting startups with business opportunities. And then our startup co-sell, which is something new that we announced. Because we realized one thing, we realized that we have a unique value proposition to sell to the world. And many of your corporate, how many here are from corporates, by the way? From corporations, not startups. Oh, there's a good bunch. So what we figured out is, we're competing with Amazon and Google by chasing taillights of startups. We're doing the same thing as everyone else, and we shouldn't. We have something very unique to us. Microsoft has 37,000 sellers selling into enterprise. How do we turn these sellers into the best tool to win startups? So we change the incentive models of our sellers so they get compensated by, working with, by selling together with startups to our largest corporate customers. Again, not an easy thing to do, but if you understand what's your unique value proposition and how can you work with startups by making them great, you're going to win a lot from that. So we had to do all kinds of changes and it's working really well. And then two years ago, we started Microsoft Ventures. Uh, Nagraj Kashyap that came from Qualcomm Ventures joined Microsoft and they're doing tremendous amount of work, uh, more than 50 investments in these last couple of years. Um, and it's, it's great to see. So finally, Microsoft had a great startup strategy, how to work with startups, how to make startups great, and how to gain share through doing that. So what are the learnings that, that I got through that process? First of all, corporates are not dead. You need to teach them new tricks. There are new ways to interact with the world, and you have to learn these ways. It doesn't work by the old way. And when I hear every time, when I meet some of the new, uh, some of the corporations I work with, and they tell me, no, we need exclusivity. No, exclusivity is gone. Uh, why would we help? Because we uh, bring more value to them and, and other people are gonna gain from that value. So what? You're gonna gain a lot in the process. So definitely need to learn new tricks. Do good, give first. This is again, not easy for a corporation to understand, what does it mean you're not paying me? What does it mean you're not my customer? Why would I help you if you're not my customer? Guess what, you're gonna gain a lot, but give first, do good. I think always something good to do. Um, think about the entrepreneurs first and the corporate second. Again, super hard to do. When we started, um, Azure, our cloud platform, was not the best platform in the world. Uh, we had Windows Phone, which was not the best mobile platform in the world. And I was sitting next to our VP of uh, uh, UK in our demo day, in our first demo day in London, and he asked me, why are you having on stage, on a Microsoft paid event, startups that are using Amazon on the back end and Android on their device? He, it was super hard for him to understand. But for me, it was very clear. We need to be credible, we need to be loved, we need people to believe that we understand what's important for them right now. Eventually, most of them did 
uh, go to Azure, did go to the Microsoft Cloud, but it was a journey. And we thought first about what's right for them at that point of time, and then about what's right for us. And it paid really well. This is a critical piece. So many corporate venture funds that exist out there, what they do is they take someone that's been in the organization for the last 30 years, 40 years, they want to retire, so instead of retiring, they give them to manage the fund. Sorry if some of you are like this here in the audience, but it's not the right way to infuse the right DNA in people that work with startups. You need to have people that are entrepreneurs, people that have done that work before, that understands what the startups are going through. They need to be able to look in their eyes and say, I was walking your steps. I know exactly what you're going through. And we're going to win this together. So you need this, the right DNA. And again, having a bunch of Israelis that never listen is always uh, helpful, I think, in these, these cases. Um, one of the things that helped us was the fact that this program was run out of Israel, not out of headquarters. I'm 100% sure that if pro was pro this program was a we would have built that out of Seattle, out of Redmond, Washington. The program would have been killed many, many times already because people at the corporate had many, many ideas. They wanted to do it differently. We grew enough far away to the point that we were too, it was too hard to shut it down. <laughs> so uh, doing it outside of headquarters is something good. The other thing that's challenging about doing these programs inside headquarters is that they become the place that you bring all your visitors to see the startups. Guess what? The startups are not a show. They're really trying to build something. They should not present all day to people that are not relevant for them. So do it outside headquarters is something critical. And then let them fly. Let people that have the right energy, the right DNA, the right passion, do what they believe in. Don't stop them. The, uh, one of the most important things for the people that manage these organizations is to protect them from the rest of the organization that is trying to shove them down into the old ways of the corporation. So let them fly. Thank you. So, is corporate innovation dead? Yeah, it's, it's dead in the way we know it. But corporate innovation could be reignited. It could be reignited through you guys, through startups if the corporates here in the room would understand there's a great way to work and help you guys grow and grow together. So thank you very much.